Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth lecture of the Spark Lecture Series. I'm glad everyone made it out. This is a real validation of the, the feedback I've been getting about more music on campus, so I'm, I'm excited. This is actually uh, one of the lectures that I was most excited, excited about. Um, when Scott and I talked about uh, starting a lecture series on campus, one of the things that we were sort of thinking about is, is not just art as a visual medium, but how it sort of crosses disciplines, mediums, and subject matter. Um, and Sam, sort of our first attempt at moving away from visual art and actually uh, getting into sort of different creative outputs. The other great part about uh, what we're hoping to do with Spark is to think about uh, lectures in a contemporary way. So how do we sort of consume culture and information about culture in a way that's also interdisciplinary? So Sam is a phenomenal musician. I would say he's my favorite musician um, and I'm extremely honored to have him here. The uh, other thing that makes him special is an extraordinary storyteller. Um, so through his stories and through his music, we're gonna learn about blues and um, forward our mission of Spark. I also wanna say that uh, the final lecture is gonna be on April 3rd, and that's uh, Ben Alexander from Made Mead Works is gonna be here, and he's gonna talk about uh, our oldest brewed beverage, mead. So for those uh, people that like wine and beer in the audience, um, we can come and sort of learn about mead. They have a patented sort of chemistry um, formula that allows them to sort of produce it in a special way. Um, it's here in Maine, they're local, as all the presenters are, so I encourage you to come out and sort of uh, support us. So um, before Sam begins, I wanna thank the Fine Arts Department and the Dean's Office for making this possible, and Sam James for coming here and joining us tonight. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, so yeah, my name is Samuel James. I'm from Portland. Um, I'm a musician. All this, all this, everything he said is true. Um, I'm drunk on mead right now. It's all true. Um, so, okay. So what I do is um, I play the guitar. And I sing, and I tell stories. And uh, this whole thing started for me when I was a child. Uh, my father used to run around and, and uh, sing this song uh, while he was like cleaning up the house in his underwear. And it was this song, The Midnight Special. I don't know if you've ever heard that song. Anybody ever hear that song before? Okay, this is for you three. <laughs> um, so, uh, this song has sort of like followed me around in my life. So like I never played the guitar until, until about 10 years ago. Um, because, whoops, <laughs> I'm new. Um, because when I was younger, like everybody like in high school, maybe I'll have friends like this where you like play the guitar and be like, hey, you wanna hear this new song on the radio? And they'd be like. I got it, wait. Oh, well. I hated that, so I hated the guitar. Um, and then I did this thing where I was like running away from my problems, and I had this girlfriend that like broke up with me, and it was a big mess. I was just such a mess, and I ran away, and I was like, "That's it, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving." So I left in the fall. I went to uh, Ireland during the rainy season because I figured, uh, what's more depressing than the rainiest country in the world <laughs> at the rainiest time of the year? Um, and this song, like Midnight Special, it sort of like followed me around. Like maybe you have moments like this where you're like, something happens to you, and like you hear the song on the radio, or the certain sort of thing happens again. And you're like, oh, maybe I should pay attention. So I'm like walking down the street. I am depressed because uh, for the obvious reasons, uh, this girl left me. Uh, I was miserable, and I'm walking down the street, and people are not friendly. There's like this bum who tries to like, and I don't mean like a homeless guy, I mean like the stereotype of like a crazy, drunk, like nutty bum, who's like, turns to me and starts like <laughs> yelling like racial epithets at me and just sort of like flailing his arms. And this is like right when I get off the plane. And I have a ticket to come back in three months. So I'm like, oh, what did I do? So like I get in the street fight with this bum. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And then I hear that song, Midnight Special, and I look over and there's this guy on the street like playing the song. And I thought, 
maybe I should do this. Maybe I should play the guitar. At the time, I was a painter. I was a, a portrait artist. And I had uh, really, uh, I was really into it, but um, I had taken all the money that I was going to use to frame pieces for an upcoming show, and I had run away to Ireland with it. <laughs> um, so I've always been as responsible as the average musician. Um, so anyway. I meet this guy, he's really great. I spend like basically three months with this guy just like watching him play the guitar. And I come back and I get a job with a framer and I frame all my pieces, I hang the artwork and then I borrow a friend's guitar and I never drew another thing or painted another thing. I spent all my time with the guitar and uh, ended up uh, <laughs> moving into a really terrible apartment, leaving my girlfriend that I'd met afterwards. But now I can play the guitar, so it's all worth it. See you later. Um, so I'll play you a song here. This is, uh, this is a song I wrote about uh, a woman who tried to kill me. Some people laugh at that. At the time, it wasn't very funny. Um, and this is done in a Piedmont style, so let me tell you about that. Piedmont style is... Um, from the Piedmont area, so you can imagine it's from North Carolina and about. And it follows this thing where it has this uh, bass line like this. Right? You with me so far? Who's with me? Yeah. But then it also has a melody. See what I'm saying? And it's to mimic like the piano at the time, which was this ragtime piano, you know. It's called Baby Doll. Singing, oh, 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 my, 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 sweet baby down, left for the city, took my loving arm. And I'm singing, oh, oh, my, 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 sweet baby down, 
left for the city, I hope she's having a ball. Right. Woke up smiling, looking for you, but I got heartbreak and reverse delay. You said June, but we're gone by May. Hey, you left me singing on my sweet baby doll. Left for the city, hope she's having a ball. Took my loving arm. So I, I fell in love with that kind of music because uh, it was kind of the music that I heard that guy playing in uh, in Ireland, you know. And he, um, <laughs> I, I came back and I started playing this kind of music. And and the thing that really struck me about it was that it was like I grew up knowing a lot about it because I'm from I'm from here. Uh, my father's black and my mother's white, um, and my father knew that if I was going to be raised here, which there was an argument about. Uh, that it was probably best if I got some kind of like black culture in the house because I probably wasn't going to get it outside. Um, so I knew a lot about this music already. And um, so picking up to play it, you sort of dig in more. And like this thing that sort of hits you is that it died in the 30s, but not because it wasn't cool anymore because or because it ran out of ideas or anything like that. It died because there was the Depression and every single like record label like went under. So all these musicians all went back to doing what they were doing before, sharecropping or preaching or, or logging or whatever. Um, so then the 60s came around and there was like a big uh, resurgence in this kind of music and there had been these bands who had discovered like all these old records and these bands were like Led Zeppelin and like Cream, Eric Clapton and like the Beatles and all these guys had rediscovered all these Robert Johnson records and, and they really liked it and they did covers and whatever and they made them for bands. So. The thing that really stuck with me is that the music died kind of like in its infancy because there's like so much you can do with it, to me, uh, that hasn't been done already. Um, so let me show you this other guitar. So this is called a resonator guitar, right? And uh, what's behind this plate is, is metal cone. So it's like, it's like if you open up a speaker, it's like what's inside that. Uh, and they were designed in the 20s because a regular guitar like this one couldn't keep up with like a horn section, you know. Um, but this can. Um, I'm going to step away from the microphone and just give it a little strum just so you can see how loud it can be. Um, <laughs> some of you look surprised. Um, it can be pretty loud and... Uh, so a lot of these old blues guys would be like on the corner trying to make some money and they pick up these guitars. And you could be heard from pretty far away. Um, I have this reoccurring nightmare that I'm tightening my strings and one snaps right into my eyeball. You might be in for a treat this evening. Um, yeah, so I got one of these guitars, and I started playing it. And I started playing it with this thing, which is a slide, right? Perhaps you've seen these before. Only one dude in this whole place has seen this slide before. Oh, two more up there. You don't count. Um, okay, so... I heard this guy named Sunhouse. And Sunhouse is this guy who, like, uh, he was, like, drunk all the time. And his guitar playing wasn't, like, fantastic. But what he could do with it, I just never heard before. And he made, like, when also, like, watching him, he, like, I'm not going to do, like, an impression of him because I'm not an impressionist. Um, I do have a really good Nick Nolte impression. Maybe I'll do later. Um, but 
he like lived and died like in the songs and like you would see him like sing and he would just like he'd be out of breath like he'd be dead by the end of it um so this song i heard and i just thought it was like the saddest maybe the greatest song i'd ever heard in my life um and it was all done with like the slide guitar it was done like this it's called death letter <coughs> water. Don't get excited. So I folded my arms, slowly walked away. Farewell, honey, you know my turn will come someday. Yes, I folded my arms and I slowly walked away. Farewell, farewell, you know I see you. I see you on Judgment Day. Break it 
Thanks. Ah, okay. <sighs> I'm tired, you guys. So, um, yeah, okay. So there's that guy, and like everything you kind of hear in blues is always kind of diff- derivative, at least slide wise, of like that one little riff. Um, so the thing that really struck me about all of this music is that like it's called blues and it weirded me out because there's so many of these songs that aren't like so far I've played you two that very much are about like love and loss but like a lot of them aren't a lot of them are about like their favorite train or like you know their job that sucks and like just like regular songs sometimes they're about women that they love that are just not sad at all um so that always weirded me out that it was called blues, and then I discovered later on that um, it was only called blues to sort of market to a white audience, because at the time, it was just called uh, reels, like real music, like R-E-A-L. Um, and a lot of it was like dance music, so like you'd see like cats like Sunhouse or the Mississippi John Hurt, or like these old guys that got rediscovered in the 60s. They would just show up with these guitars and just start playing like at the at the dance on the weekends, you know. Um, there's this guy, very famous guy named Charlie Patton, who like lived at this dockery plantation, and he didn't do a lick of work. He just sat and played the guitar all the time, um, and everybody really loved him for it. I think probably some people really hated him for it, um, but he became very famous. So famous you're hearing about him for the first time tonight. Um, I'm going to play a little dance song now. This is a song I wrote called Woo Rosa, and it's, uh, you can dance to it if you want. In fact, everybody get a partner.
So, um, my point is, uh, <laughs> that kind of stuff wasn't really done, uh, you know, back in the 30s. And it's not as though people didn't have fingers and guitars and stuff. They could have done it, you know. Um, so it's kind of a fun thing for me to, like, come into this and to, like, you know, kind of on a whim see this guy and just decide, like, there's all this other stuff that can be done with it. And it's, it's a cool thing. It's just, like, a cool idea that, like, you're not limited by what's been done, you know what I mean? You're sort of inspired by it, I guess. That's one way to look at it. That's how I look at it. Um, uh, so, yeah, let me tell you the story about, about um, this next song. Uh, I wrote it uh, for, for my father, and uh, I went to his house, and I said, uh, hey, I got this song that I wrote for you. He's like, oh, cool, let's hear it. So I played it for him, and he said, thank you. And then he said, uh, that's nice that you wrote this song for me. What you neglected to say is that it's also about me. And I said, it is also about you. And the price that I'm willing to pay for that is that you get to give it its title. So he said, okay, 19. Um, right? And uh, now you're going to hear the song. Uh, you're going to notice that number 19 is nowhere in this song. And you're going to wonder, why is it called 19? As I wondered that when he told me. So he says, uh, and again, you've never met my father, so I'll do my best impression of his voice. But he said, uh, I said, what, what do you want to call me? He's like, 19. I said, why? And he said, <clears throat> I said, why? He said, <clears throat> you said I could call it whatever I want. <laughs> so the song's called 19. <laughs> and if you ever see a guy who looks like me but about 65 years old, don't ask him why it's called 19. <clears throat> My father was a man driven blind by a woman whose beauty made most men deaf. Knowing the sort of man to point to the right, but only with the hand on his left. And on that wrist of toll time with a white chain that had just one hand. Kept 45 hourglasses in his basement all without any sand. When that senseless woman came into the room, he always refused to stand. And if he asked why, under his breath he'd say, she thinks I'm taller than I am. Mm -hmm. Well. I seen that man die times in his life, but it never did seem to take. He'd say death is a photographer's son. Some pictures gotta retake. He'd been knocked in the head, slammed through the belly, and shot straight through the chest. But he's a persistent sore yeah. Not the kind to take much rest. Take a nap in the middle of the desert. Neath the sandstorm, a force tan gale. Wake up, grinning ear to ear. Bleeding in a Mexico jail. And he'd speak on his own father, make himself seem meek. Oh, Gus could make 10 million in a month, who's twice that. In less than a week, had a smile so bright you could see it at night through a wall of solid lead. His right hand would kill you straight, but his left make you wish that you were dead.
that senseless woman died long ago. Miss Cypher turned on her past. Spent more years without her than will. Says his wife shall moss go by. Watch the moss go by. Is watch the moss. Every chance he gets, he says, look me in the eye, boy. Get your face out the mud. Without a good woman, you're as much use as a cigarette ash in a flag. You better settle down, son. Adventure just ain't in your blood. time to do like a couple more for you guys. Um, I want to tell you this story about this one. Hmm. When I was a kid, I had to move schools in like the middle of the year. And I moved to, uh, <clears throat> to Bitterford from Gorham. What a mess that was. Um, and this thing that happens when you move to like a town, I was a sophomore in high school. When we moved to a town where, uh, Everybody knows everybody, and they have their whole lives, and nobody knows you. There are all these rumors that abound as to why you're there. And the number one rumor that stuck uh, for me was that um, I had moved to this new school because at my previous school, I had set another child on fire. Which, as everybody in the room knows, the price you pay for that is that they make you switch schools. <laughs> um, so there was this girl at this school that I really liked, and like, I didn't really know where I fit in, and like, you know, like, high school social stuff sucks, and you're just like, where do I fit in? Especially this new school. And I didn't think there was really like a set, like, group of like, other corn road skate kids who were black and white. There weren't, so uh, I didn't know where to fit in. But I really wanted to talk to this girl. But it turns out, and I don't think this is only true for our high school girls, or I think it's true for, for women in general, but I think that if you're talking to a woman and there's like the slightest chance that there's even a slighter chance that she thinks you might set her on fire, <laughs> your chances are out the window. Um, so this is a song I wrote about that. It's called Camus. <clears throat> too long or I grew tired of living all this repetition became unforgiving nothing was bad nothing was good nothing could 
confused, eh, 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 nothing understood. No one was any better or worse off than myself. Nothing had importance over anything. Turn to the rubble that ended all right now. If it was worth the trouble, I'd end it all right now. If it was worth the, worth the trouble. And as the rest but a part, watch it all go by. I play this guitar yeah. as we continue to, as we continue to. Thanks. I have time for one more, yeah? So I try to end like all my sets with one song, you know? It's this one, it's called Hobo Blues. Ready? You said on the mic. I try to end all my sets with one song. It's this one, it's called Hobo Blues. Uh, it was written by this guy, Yank Rochelle, who none of you have heard of, but it was made popular by this other guy named John Lee Hooker, who maybe some of you have heard of. Anybody heard of John Lee Hooker in this room? Anybody under 30 heard of John Lee Hooker in this room? Oh, how old are you, 29? That doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, John Lee Hooker was uh, maybe the last like blues guy who was like a superstar. Like he went around the world and people really loved him, and he was uh, an old coot with glasses. And, like he would talk like this at the microphone. <laughs> and he he was a, he was a funny dude because he uh, he he came out of like Mississippi, like like straight out of like the cotton cotton fields, you know, so like he didn't have like any education and he would get kind of like surly, like if he, if he thought you like maybe were high on your own education, he'd get kind of surly with you. So he, uh, he used to do this thing with his bands where, anybody in this room musicians? Yeah, okay. You are gonna love this story. So he'd have a whole band, you know, but he was used to playing by himself. And if he thought anybody was getting too like high on themselves, he just change keys in the middle of the song and not tell anybody what key it was. <laughs> or there'd be time for a chord change and he just wouldn't do it. <laughs> when everyone's listening to him sing in the same chord and the, all the band guys just look around at each other. <laughs> um, anyway, my point is, that guy, big jerk. Um, but here's a song that he played really well. Um, <clears throat> it's called Hobo Blues. My dear old 
mother Well, my dear old mother Well, my dear old mother She followed me down to the yard My son is gone. Well, my son is gone. Well, my son is gone. Off in this world somewhere. Oh, Lord. I left my dear old mother.
Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Without you guys, I'm alone in my room doing this, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> At this time, um, we're going to open up for question and answers. If anyone has a question they want to ask Sam about the blues or his music or his guitars or, or a wonderful haircut, maybe? Haircut. Um, you give me the mic so we can get it on. First question, all the way in the back. Hey there, thank you so much. Uh, I was just curious, do you, uh, a lot of great bluesmen name their guitars? Have you named your guitars? You're asking me if I've named my guitar. Um, no. Uh, at one point I did actually name my guitar and then soon, naming a guitar is a lot like naming like a band or like a lot of people come up with names, you know what I mean? So like if you come up with the name of a band and you Google it, Probably there's already a band. So I came up with a name for my guitar, and then I Googled it, and it was already a band. And it wasn't a good band. So uh, I stopped naming my guitar after that. <laughs> Anybody else? All the way down here. Uh, you talked about when you picked up the guitar, but when did you start singing, and did you always sort of did it take you a while to find your style and your voice, or did it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, can everybody hear her question okay? Should I repeat it into the microphone? You guys, you guys look at me like I'm not wearing pants right now. <laughs> um, yeah, you asked me if I, my singing voice, uh, if it took me a while. Yeah, I'm still trying to find it. Um, but the, the basic idea that I'm trying to do is just keep up with my guitars very loud, and I find that the louder that I am, the, the easier it is to, like, find a note. Um, but singing is something that like, so like everybody in my family as far back as like slavery can play an instrument. So my father was born in 1945. His father was born in 1890. And then his father was a freed slave. So n not that far back people wise, but time wise, everybody can play an instrument. All the aunts, uncles, everybody, no one can sing. Uh, it's to the everlasting shame of our family. I'm the only one and this is the best we can do. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I think I started playing the guitar. I could, I've been playing piano since I was like a child. Um, but singing was something that was like, uh, yeah, it still, it still sort of mystifies me when people can have like those, like Beyonce kind of voices where you're just like, what? That's not even practical. Like, why, why are you doing that? Um, yeah, I think more of like Bill Withers or like Johnny Cash and like sort of if I can hit those eight notes, I consider myself pretty good. Uh, yeah. So that's it. I discovered it because I was in a Jeep that didn't have a top, and I was on the highway, and I was trying to sing a song to the person next to me. I was like, you know that song? And it goes like this. And they're like, I can't hear you. And then all of a sudden, I was like, it goes like this. And they were like, oh. I was like, am I singing it? They were like, sort, sort of. That was yesterday, and here we are. Anybody else? Did uh, Johnny Cash influence your bass note picking? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no. Uh, <laughs> so, like, the trick with, like, Johnny Cash and all that stuff, there's, like, a whole kind of, like, color thing that I would just love to talk about, like, all night. Um, so, like, uh, mm -hmm. So this is like a, it's like a kind of a country strum, right? And it exists like uh, in all kinds of songs. Um, there's, you ever hear this thing uh, called Travis picking? Okay, so Travis picking is basically what I've been doing all night. And there's this weird kind of like color line that goes between the, uh, like blues music and like country music. And really there's like no line at all. So like you have like the, fir the first guy who was like, the father of the country music, if you look up his record, it's all blues covers. So like the first country music like album ever was all blues songs. Um, and this song is called Folsom Prison Blues, right? There's really no line. Um, there's a line when you go to the store and you're like, okay, where do I look <laughs> in what section? Um, but soon there won't be music stores anymore, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, 
Yeah, so like this, this sort of thing has existed in, it comes from a technique that's like called frailing, which is for the banjo, right? Um, or claw hammer or uh, downstroke style or slave style. It's got like a million names. Uh, but it all sort of came from the banjo, which was an African instrument that was like a gourd, right? Um, so in a way, Johnny Cash absolutely influenced, but in another way, uh, I stole his influences. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Oh, you're working for it tonight. Boom. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to give you Ping a little exercise. Oh, well, you've done it. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, I was kind of interested that you uh, talked about going to Ireland and, uh, and playing there. Yeah. And uh, there's very few people of color over there. Yeah. In fact, tell me about it. Even in the Irish language, they didn't even have a word for that. Yeah. And uh, eventually they came up with a word because. Yeah, it's not a good one either. Not a good one, no. Um, <laughs> And I guess I was interested in knowing what's it like for you to play in your style in a totally different environment? You like mean like Europe or you mean like Ireland or you mean... Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, it's... Well, I, don't know, I guess that's kind of a good question. They're all good questions, by the way, you guys. No bad questions. Um, I think that... Uh, have you seen my haircut? I'm not used to blending in, I guess, you know what I mean? So like it's, it's uh, like I'm from here. But then on the other hand, I am used to blending in because here I'm black, but like in New York, I'm Puerto Rican. And in Texas, I'm Mexican. <laughs> and like every place in the world, like I look like I could be from any place in the world except where I'm actually from. So like being, being in another place where people, I'll tell you the, the core difference is that like in Europe and in places just basically every place outside of the U.S. that I've played, um, and I've played in like as far east as like Turkey, all over Europe. The difference is, is that like they're like musical musicians are thought of as people who have actual jobs, so it's like it's thought of and it's sort of re respected differently. You know, it's uh, I think this is kind of a cliche thing to say, but like. People, people actually want to hear what you're doing, and it's not as just sort of disposable as it is here. You know what I mean? Where it's like everything has like a house remix. You know what I mean? And like um, there, it's like it's thought of as a profession, so it's respected more. So people listen more. Um, there's very few times I've played in Europe where it's been like the football game has been on at the same time or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, in case you don't know what I mean, sometimes you're a musician you're playing a bar. There's football game on. Everyone's watching that. They don't give a damn about you. Um, that doesn't happen over there. Um, because I think they look at it as though, like, if you were an architect and someone came in in the middle of a meeting and put on the football game, right? Um, so that's, that's sort of been the core difference that I've noticed. Uh, I will say that, like, like, being, like, a sort of nondescript brown person, like, traveling at airports can be rough. Um, if any of you ever become nondescriptly brown, I would say don't go to, or darker, do not go to uh, Romania. Romania is awesome, but like the airport, I was with some people, they had dreadlocks, they got searched. <laughs> they got like naked searched, they got searched, searched. That's it. <laughs> I'm not gonna go any further. Does that answer your question? Okay. I just wanted to tell you that, um, that was interesting what you said about the uh, changing of the chords and the I mean the keys in the middle of the, the tune. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I was reminded of uh, a pub in Ireland that was well known for traditional music and there was a piano in that pub. So uh, a lot of people used to try to jump into the piano and play along with the musician. <laughs> but what they didn't know was the piano was tuned one half note lower. <laughs> and it was just to keep people from doing that. So oh. that reminded me of that. And to answer Michelle's uh, question, Maybe uh, you, if you were given permission to, to name your guitars whatever you wanted to, maybe you could name them 17 and 18. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to ask my father's permission for that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Anybody else? All right.
Thank you again. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful. Uh, and uh, you talked about the role of your father. Mm. And so what about the role of your mother and name? Oh, those? okay. Uh, well, my mother died when I was very young. I didn't want to bring that up because, boy, that can really kill the mood. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my parents, when I was very young, uh, my father's from, from the Southwest, and they had this discussion as to where I would be brought up. And uh, at first their decision was the Southwest because uh, I wouldn't stick out as much. But the options that they had for the money they had at the time were really limited, and we were living in sort of ghettos until I was like three. And there was, came this moment where like uh, all of our lives were like in some pretty serious danger. Uh, it was the kind of neighborhood where like my father came home from going to the store and there was somebody in his house who had like locked him out. And he pounded on the door. And my father at the time was like a big guy, like 6'2", like 260, like a big guy. Pounds on the door and there's a guy inside and a bunch of guys and they're all just like cooking drugs in his apartment, they just moved in. And it was a kind of neighborhood where like you couldn't like, the cops don't come down and even if they did, this guy would be having a couple of days and knows how to get to your apartment when you're not there, you know what I mean? Like, at that moment my father pretty much lost everything he owned except for what he had in the grocery bag. So uh, it was either be raised a place where I stuck out like a sore thumb or possibility I wouldn't be raised at all. So we moved uh, here to, to Maine, and uh, yeah. But then, then my mother died, and that story is too sad for this room right now. Um, yeah, but to get off that subject, I will tell you all a joke. Uh, what is orange and sounds like a parrot? A carrot. I didn't say it would be a good joke. Any other questions? <laughs> Last one. Woo -hoo. All right. This is going to be a long winded academic question. Okay. Great. I love Ready? It. So, I know there's no encore in the blues, uh -huh. but if there were an encore in the blues, like what would that sound like? So we could just like leave this thing with some, you know, a little shake in the walls. Maybe. With one more? Maybe one more. Can we do a one more? I can try one more, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I like this. All right, all right, let's yeah, give yeah, it one yeah. more. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> well, I really can cap for that for no reason, for no reason. even thought of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, me tune, let me tune this thing first while I uh, figure out what I'm going to do. <laughs> So um, what allows me to, oh my God, I'm so terrified right now, you guys. <laughs> this is my uh, tuners on my iPhone because I'm a man of the future. I got this iPhone in 2011, man of the future. Um, so you're, you're, what instrument do you play? Acoustic guitar? Cool. I can empathize with you guys. Uh, here's the thing about acoustic guitars. They don't like lights, weather, air. They don't like anything. So tuning. Oh, that's the worst. And especially like I play, you may have noticed this, I play kind of percussively, so uh, strings don't like to stay in tune. You wanna come on now? Don't break. Oh, don't do that. Don't even tease me about it. I'll tell you the last show I played, uh, last show I played was uh, in New Hampshire last week. And at the end of the night, I played hobo blues. And once I had the guitar spun to this half, 
I broke a string. But it actually wasn't a string. It was actually one of these tuning machines just blew apart. There's no coming back from that. <laughs> you need to take a guitar into the shop to get it fixed. Uh, so this is the first show I've played with this new uh, tuning peg. I'm terrified right now. It's going to break, you guys. I have to sing a cappella. Well, let's face it. That's not why we're here right now. <laughs> Okay, that's pretty good. Um, okay, I'm gonna do, you ever hear this guy named Leonard Cohen? You ever hear this guy? Okay, really? Great. Um, he's, yeah, he's just somebody that like, I don't hear a lot about anymore. Like every once in a while I hear he goes on tour because he's out of money or whatever. But um, He's like, you know, for those of you who don't know who he is, but you know who Bob Dylan is, he's like Canada's Bob Dylan. Um, Really amazing songwriter. He's not a great singer or great musician or anything, but just like the lyrics, that's where it is with him. Uh, so the good thing about that is that if you can sing even a little bit better than him, which I can, a little bit, uh, you know, you can do one of his songs like pretty well. Um, George Carlin, you know George Carlin, a comedian? He's been dead for like five years. Yeah, he said this thing about he never thought of himself as a comedian, he thought of himself as a songwriter, not a songwriter, a writer. I'm a songwriter. He's a comedian. He never thought of himself as a comedian, but like a writer who nobody else would do as material. And I kind of think of myself like that, too. Uh, and I definitely think of Lenny Cohen like that. Anybody else care what I think about other musicians? Yes? Okay. <laughs> Great. I'm with you. Um, okay. So this is Leonard Cohen's song. It's called uh, Tower of Song. <coughs> okay. I'm almost there, you guys. Oh, you're going to love it. Almost there. <laughs>
Well, you can stick your little pins in that voodoo doll. I'm very sorry, baby. It doesn't look like me at all. You know, I'm standing by the window. Well, the light is strong, yeah. Well, they don't let a woman kill you, not up here in the tower song. Well, you can say I'm going bitter, but of this you can't be sure. The rich have got the channel in the bedrooms of the poor, and there's a mighty judgment coming. Hey, 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 hey. But I could be wrong, because you hear these funny voices up here in the Tower of Song. Well, I'm leaving pretty, baby. I don't know when I'll be back. They're moving us tomorrow to a tower across the track, but you'll be hearing from me, darling, long after I'm gone. Yeah. I'll be singing to you sweetly from a window right here in the tower song.
the answer to your question would look something like that. <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, my name is Samuel James. Uh, thank you to St. Joe's for having me. Right on. Thank and you, just Chris. a reminder, on April 3rd is going to be the last uh, of the Spark Lectures for this semester. So I encourage you all, if you enjoyed this, come out. It'll be just as enjoyable. Um, almost as enjoyable. Thank you. <laughs>